Aiden from the Bickering Peaks podcast, and they now go by the Bix and cover Shakespeare, but you know, they definitely did a really great job covering the diary in one of their Twin Peaks episodes when they were Bickering Peaks. He kind of thinks that um, Laura pulled Leo further into the woods because kind of at the beginning, he's more of just like a... Uh, like a hedonistic experiencer. I mean, I I wouldn't exactly call him akin to Jerry Horn per se, but you know, it's like they uh, they seem to kind of work on appetite. Um, but then you know he gets into hitting Laura a lot, and um, you know after after a certain point, like when Laura's sixteen, when she's seventeen, um, you know, it's like he can't tell when Laura's serious or whether she's like in one of their fantasy um scenarios that they like to do when they're having sex with each other um you know it's like he instead of um laura like having trouble breathing you know he he thinks you know it's like oh she's really into it and then he like hits her so hard that she gets a bruise and even though jacques says it in the series leo is the one that he's quoting when he says bite the bullet baby so Leo becomes more and more unfeeling as this series goes on. And um, yeah, I mean, so does Laura, essentially. So Leo is kind of the mile marker for where Laura is um, for for a while in the diary. Now, in the diary, the one who keeps her a little bit safer in those situations is Jacques. And he won't notice right away either in those situations, but he does get there eventually. Um, he was always described as, you know, like an untraditional kind of guy that she would really be into. You know, I mean, she calls him, you know, it's like, oh, he's a fat guy, you know, it's like, but, but he's also always able to turn her on. Um, I mean, one of the things Jacques does is, um, you know, that, that same Christmas when, um, when Laura and Bobby have their tender moment, the same Christmas where she's dancing with Leland uh, for the last time in the book, you know, Jacques is there, actually. He's the one who gives her a present. Um, you know, he's he's able to notice um, her outside of when he sees her, too. You know, it's like she, he, he gives her that secret. You know, it's like it's it's in her bra. There's the wand she can... Uh, you know, she could play with, there's the Coke in there. Um, you know, it's like he, he knew what she would like and, you know, he, he put it in a little secret because that's kind of her deal. You know, that's something that she would like. Um, you know, it's like he, he, he likes catering to her needs too. He's kind of like a cross between Bobby and Leo in a lot of ways. And it's mostly with Leo and Jacques, um, you know, she finds she finds a copy of Flesh World, and I will talk about the Danielle part later. But um, she finds she finds Flesh World right at the beginning, like right after that um, experience in Lowtown with the drug deal that went south. Um, she um, she finds Flesh World. She wants to write a fantasy that will get published in there, and um, you know, she's like talking about it and working her way through it with Jacques and Leo most of the time. So she actually feels safe around these guys to explore herself. But the one of that group that really helps her and really seems to be a protector is Ronette. You know, it's like they, um, I mean, she's not there often in, in the story for a while. I mean, I, I think she's there the whole time that, you know, cause she meets, uh, she meets Laura the same time that, um, uh, or I mean, we, in the diary, she shows up the same party with Leo. So, like, she's kind of in that circle though, anyway. But um, we don't really hear that she's connected a lot with, um, with Jacques and Leo until we get that note after that life-threatening experience where Laura was captured by those truckers and she had to find her way out. And, um, you know, Laura was basically... Um, outside of herself after that i mean she was a mess and she somehow makes it back to leo's or jacques apartment um i i i think it was jacques cabin but anyway like the the one who wrote the note um after laura kind of came to and found herself in her own bedroom um it was ronette who was voicing you know it's like okay we you were you were such a mess um that we uh we tried to get you um together and we got you home um 
if anybody asks about this, uh, do this, you know, it's like she, she was giving Laura kind of a script of like, you know, th this is how to catch you up and how to keep you safe. And, um, you know, th this is what we did. We hope you're okay. So like, uh, Ronette actually, um, I mean, she, you could tell like they have kind of like a, we're going to help each other out kind of thing. You know, Ron Ronette is really good for Laura here. And so good that eventually, you know, like we, we find out that, um, you know, they, they have a, a, a secret language for when they party, you know, it's like, the, you know, saying this means, you know, bring Coke, you know, uh, saying this means I have it, you know, just come and enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> there's, um, th there's, there's, I mean, she, she essentially fills a role that, um, that Laura hasn't had in her life since Donna. And, um, you know, it's like, well, well, while Ronette kind of stayed in her own world and um, didn't really talk to, you know, she, she was kind of cutting herself off from Laura when Laura decided to be sober after she found out she was pregnant. Um, you know, not that Ronette knew that, but, um, but um, you know, it's like they, they have their worlds and Ronette does have her boundaries and everything. But, um, you know, when Laura decides to get back into the drugs, um, you know, Ronette welcomes her back, um, you know, about as well as you can. And, you know, the, they, they stay friends, you know, it's like they, they are the people who watch each other's back during partying and, um, you know, they have a lot of fun together and, um, that's pretty good for, for Laura and, um, the, you, they they never go into it because they don't really go into the uh, the working class people in Twin Peaks, you know, except for Shelley. But that's because she accidentally became a main character in casting. Um, <clears throat> so like we we never really hear about the uh, the people that you know, like we we don't hear about Ronette's life here, and um, about the only clue that we get that she and Laura have more in common is that. Um, you know, when Laura's talking about liking her body and, you know, like when she first met, um, Ronette at Leo's party, um, we hear about Ronette's sad eyes. So like, we know there's something in Ronette's, um, head that we're not getting access to, but we also can kind of see the road she's on. But regardless, I think Laura is good for her too. and. Ronette is definitely good for Laura here. Um, a good piece of the support system, even if it's in Laura's secret world. Now, while all this is happening, when, when Laura's 15, um, you know, while she's doing the exploring her sexual fantasies in a safe way, you know, quote unquote, safe way with Leo and Jacques, um, you know, while she's partying with Ronette, um, the uh, the flesh world stuff is almost always paralleled with Johnny Horn, and that's where that's where we really do see a lot of Laura's light side, and um, it's it's it, as segmented as um, or as car as compartmentalized as Laura keeps herself. It's really interesting to see how she is with Johnny Horn. But um, we're we're going to take a bit of a break to um, hear some some uh, we're going to take a break to hear more from our fellow podcasters at the Ruminations Radio Network. And then we'll get back to Johnny. Hey, kids, it's Don Shanahan from the Cinephile Hissy Fit, one of the podcasts on the Ruminations Radio Network. If you've been enjoying this show, come listen to Will Johnson and I fight it out over cinema's best and worst on the Cinephile Hissy Fit. Find us and all the great shows over on RuminationsRadioNetwork.com. Welcome back. It's uh, time to start talking about Johnny Horn. <clears throat> One of the few bright spots of this whole book. Uh, he, he, most of his appearance is, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> most of his appearances happen when Laura is 15 and 16 years old. Um, and um, most of them are paralleled with um, 
with Laura talking about writing fantasies for uh, for Flesh World. So when she's talking about the the fantasies in Flesh World, she's exploring her sexuality in a non judgmental space because you know uh, Jacques and Leo are you know all about whatever <laughs> you know it's a, you know they're they're all in for whatever she wants to experiment with. So that's actually a good safe place for her right there. And um, it, it's kind of nice and it, it's telling that it matches up with Johnny because when she's with Johnny, she basically gets to exist in a non judgmental, uh, love tuned wavelength. Um, so, yeah, I mean, she's, um, she's actually, even though this is the most dangerous, most depressing parts of, uh, of Laura's life in, in this age range, 15 and 16, um, it's, it's still a nice um a nice positive angle to things um and and um i know with with johnny there's no sexuality talked about at all um but um i mean essentially what she's doing here is sure the diary you know lets her lets her express herself but um as that one um guest of the uh the the logcast um podcast um she was saying that um you know the diary can't express love it can't uh show like where her dis you know cognitive dissonances are actually dissonances so um you know johnny can't do that either but he can give back love, which is a step up from where the diary is. Uh, the first time we see Johnny Horn is when Laura's 12. Um, or actually, it's um, it's at the beginning of when she's 13. Um, she learns that uh, this is the one where she learns that Ben gave Laura Troy and not her dad. And Johnny happens to be there. And um, he seems to be about the only welcome addition of that whole thing. Um, Laura describes Johnny as slow and older than I am, but has mentality of a small child, which she says that's what the doctors say about her. And she wonders if he's chosen not to speak this whole time because it's more interesting to listen. Um, one connection that I make is, is Johnny's actually in, in this kind of, you know, the, the way he just kind of radiates a piece to her. Um, it's kind of like how Andy is the uh, deputy Andy or, or Cooper Dougie. And, um, you know, Andy gets invited to talk to the fireman and, um, you know, Cooper Dougie, uh, basically changes everybody who he meets, uh, changes their lives for the positive. So to be in that kind of a category is a pretty good thing. Now, one thing that's consistent with the series that we've seen up to this point is he definitely does live in his own world. And um, I know Elle talked about it in the pilot, but, um, you know, obviously there's some kind of trauma and neglect in his past, um, but that's not really explored here. I mean, the effects are explored because um, when when um, Laura's 15, she does see Johnny Horn again and thinks that he seems... Uh, and these are her words, lifeless, unattended to, sad. And um, that's when she decides to tutor him three times a week. You know, she's, um, uh, again, this is like, I mean, you know, even the lady at the party, you know, the uh, Leo's party. I mean, she basically treats others that need help the way she'd like to be treated. It's it's that, that, um, that projecting onto others what she needs and, um, you know, giving others what she's, not believing she deserves herself now from this tutoring arrangement um you know she gets money and she's happy about that part but the real value she says is he doesn't judge no matter what she does when she's not around him uh doesn't even want to sleep with her there's no abuse no touching no talking the only thing he really wants from her is for her to read to him um he loves fairy tales so, you know, the Peter Pan that um, uh, Robert Bauer brought with him on set, the actor of Johnny Horn, um, you know, it, it kind of lines up with, you know, this love of fairy tales. And um, Laura in the book says Sleeping Beauty is his favorite. So, you know, there's another dreamer situation uh, of somebody like completely unable to wake up. Now, here she explains how she slows down 
to explain things that he doesn't understand. And, you know, it's like, he'll, he'll like perk up when he doesn't get things. So like, he's actually pretty, pretty with it around Laura, which is a, another good sign that, you know, something positive frequency is happening. And, um, you know, there, there's that savant kind of thing going on too, where, you know, he shoots arrows and his aim is absolutely true and it hits the target, you know, bullseyes every time or, you know, close to every time anyway. Um, now, Laura does say she needs to do lines to maintain her patience. Um, so, I mean, there there is that undercurrent still, you know, it's not like Laura's like, you know, oh, the light switch is on, you know, she's nothing but, you know, light and gold, you know, she's, um, she's still it, Laura Palmer, even in this side of things. And, um, you know, there in, in that, um, in that first explanation of you know how she um how she does tutor johnny she says that she did a bob impression once um she says it's the worst she's ever felt and she apologized until he forgave her which um you know it kind of matches up with him having trauma in the past but he really does have the ability to forgive her and he does with based on later things in this book um the the thing in the margins that I'm not sure about with that is, you know, she talks about doing a Bob impression and obviously she'd have enough material to do a Bob impression, but is it her actually embodying Bob? You know, like when, when she, when she gets in that, um, black and white kabuki makeup in uh, fire walk with me at Harold's place where she says, you know, fire walk with me. And, um, you know, like w was she channeling Bob that way where like, she actually did have a little bit of Bob um, coming through her at the time. It's a very interesting question. Uh, and, and obviously there's no way to really answer that. There's a good case to be made for the supernatural seeping in, or if she's just, you know, mirroring the behavior that she's learned. Now, the day that she absolutely learns that, um, that flesh world is ready to publish people's fantasies and that she wants to write for it. Um, that's a day where she takes Johnny outside in sunlight. I mean, it's it's uh, another connection of light. Um, and in this day when, you know, she's thinking about, oh, she's going to get published and doing, you know, exploring all this this side of her. Um, she She's in a good enough mood where she just tells Johnny any story after another. She babbles on without judgment. And, you know, she doesn't say exactly which stories, but the fact that Johnny really wasn't paying attention to anything but her vocal tone, um, you know, she probably said a lot. And um, honestly, it'd be a lot like dumping your your stories onto a therapist in a way. It's like freeing to get it out of you, uh, even if there's no reaction or a response back. Besides, um, you know, his... his <laughs> Laura says Johnny's only response is joy. And at the end of that trip, after after Sylvia comes back in, I think this is her only appearance in the, the diary, um, she basically, uh, uh, Laura is in there with Johnny, and he says, like, the first sentence I think she's probably ever heard him say, besides, yes, an Indian uh, those are his like two favorite words. Um, she said, or <laughs> he tells her, I love you, Laura. Now, as usual, Laura is very proud of him. You know, she says, you know, this is a leap for him. But then, you know, she says, this is the highest compliment she's ever received. And, um, I mean, that, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, somebody who usually doesn't speak and only radiates joy and like comes out enough to say that they love you. I mean, how you, you can't get much better next time we hear from johnny it's um right after the meals on wheels are kind of starts um harold's already been introduced the josie english lessons begin too and um that time in the um what do you call it that time in the uh double r ends with her going to the horns place uh, Bobby dropping off Coke because, you know, you still have to have that Laura participating. And, um, you know, she's basically reading stories and eating ice cream with, with Johnny all night. Sounds like a pretty good day overall. Um, 
I'm I'm going to take a quick tangent on Meals on Wheels. Um, that day at the Double R, um, it kind of begins from jealousy, honestly, or competition, I should say, from Shelly. And um, I know I haven't said much about Shelly, and I'm probably still not going to say much. But um, you know, there, there's this competition between Laura and um, and Shelly because they're both seeing Leo, even though Shelly doesn't, uh, she doesn't seem to know. Uh, so Shelly's treating this, this woman, uh, fairly nicely. It's an older woman. Uh, she, uh, what do you call it? The, the, the woman's there eating pie and coffee, you know, positive frequency indicators if I ever saw any. And then, uh, Shelly is the one who helps let her out the door. And, um, you know, this is when Laura talks to Norma and, uh, Laura had, uh, Laura had just started drinking coffee in this moment. And pretty much everybody knows from Cooper and the sheriff's station that, you know, if you're drinking coffee, you're on a positive frequency too. So, um, you know, sure, there's the Shelly angle to it, but, you know, all, all sides of Laura need to be represented when she makes big things happen. Um, you know, Laura's watching Shelly help this woman and uh, Norma says lots like her in town and no one to help them. You know, Laura decides to go into co uh, competitive mode, I think she says. And, um, you know, it's always easier to focus on other people to help. And um, honestly, this is after after everything happened with Jupiter and Troy. So, you know, it's like she's supposed to be taking care of those animals when she had them. but. Um, you know, it's like now that she's kind of grown a little bit and gotten things like Johnny Horn to say, I love you. Um, she's kind of able to take that next leap and, um, you know, focus on helping people who also need help. And again, she's projecting what she wants people to do for her onto other people in, in this case, a positive direction. It's basically showing that, you know, as she's fighting back against Bob, she actually is growing her light too, even though she might not necessarily recognize that's what's happening. Uh, so yeah, the, the meals on wheels, that's where Harold comes from. And, um, you know, she talks about him. He was, a he became a shut in overnight one time and, uh, you know, he doesn't really know how, um, but you know, he can't leave his house. Um, Unlike Johnny, Harold can speak to her. He is aroused by her, uh, fearful when she approaches, uh, when, yeah, you know, when she approaches Harold. So, you know, he's, he's kind of almost like Johnny's, um, darker side in a way, you know, it's like he, he, he operates from fear and, um, and because Harold comes from more of a fear frequency, um, Basically, I mean, Laura says that, you know, he's kind of like prey and, you know, sometimes she plays with him and um, Bob impressions, impressions, quote unquote, um, show up there as well. And, uh, you know, we saw in Firewalk with me that the Bob impression really did come through her um, for, you know, from a Bob's uh, a Bob point of view in that movie. So I, I suspect that that's most likely what the impression is um and you know she hates herself later um after she does things but i mean she uh, eventually as you know she gets older it's i i think when she's 17 she actually rapes harold and it's not ideal at all um and you know she hates herself for it but she also admits that it makes her feel strong so again you know both sides of laura coming out uh, I don't know. It's, it's not ideal, but, um, that's kind of where the meals on wheels, um, part of the book travels to, but you know, on the, on the, on the more, on, on the more forgiving side, I guess, um, Harold does seem to forgive her enough where she considers his place to be the safest place for her to, um, to give the diary when she knows she's on her way out. Now, going back to Johnny, the last time we hear about him in the diary at all, I mean, we know it keeps going based on, you know, how Johnny reacts to um, Laura not coming, um, you know, from the pilot on. But um, you know, the last time we see him in the diary, he actually leads right into Jacoby because Jacoby is watching I mean, and they're, um, they're all shooting arrows together um, or watching Johnny shoot arrows together. Um, 
I mean, probably what's going to happen is Johnny comes up in the audio tapes that Laura records for Jacoby because that's more of the uh, the positive leaning, more honest part of where Laura puts her experiences um, once that starts up. Yeah, now Jacoby is really skeezy, and I mean, there's elements of that here too, but there's a lot of actual growth that Laura's going through in this, and um, it comes directly from her experiences with Johnny Horn, which she decided to do on her own. So, you know, this is definitely the um, the lighter side of Laura's soul coming through in a way. And um, it's uh, it's like the why she's fighting Bob part is growing her light. And, um, you know, it's to help out people like Johnny and, you know, the Meals on Wheels people and that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, so, um, okay, again, um, the diary is a place where she can express herself and Johnny Horn can give back love. And then Jacoby, the next part of this chain, um, he can point out the cognitive distortions as distortions. And, um, that is massively important. Um, and, and Laura is honest with him to a, a large degree, I assume, because, uh, because she says that, Jacoby's fallen in love with two Lauras. Um, he, he doesn't find it, um, you know, negative at all. He finds it enticing and honest. Um, and then um, uh, Cheryl Lee in the audiobook especially reads this with such disdain that he doesn't mock her pain. He accepts it. And, you know, like that, that's just so ugly to Laura. Like, why in the world would you accept her pain? Um, and, um, you know, I mean, this is just her, um, you know, coming up against, um, you know, her belief system uh, for the first, you know, uh, opposition to her belief, her real belief system for probably the first time in a long time. Uh, first time since Bobby, I would imagine. And, you know, even then, Bobby's not a trained therapist. He probably just went with whatever she was, you know, uh, pushing him to do. Uh, so, um, you know, Laura will tell him, uh, will tell Jacoby things. But she says he always recognizes that, and I'm quoting Laura, the lighter part of Laura never wanted to do the um, the things that Laura would say to him that, to shock him and you know, turn him on her essentially. I think she's trying to force that. Um, so yeah, the, um, the lighter part of Laura never wanted to do these things in the first place. You know, another honest thing she really comes out and says is she hates Jacoby for never confirming her worst fears that she's become like Bob. And it's telling about what their sessions must be like, because at the very end of that entry, she says, maybe it's like he says it is. I have forgotten how to be loved. Now, right before she met Jacoby, this is when she decided to do that public Laura diary, the one that um, that um, Hawk and um, and Leland, um, you know, talk over in Laura's room in the pilot. Uh, <clears throat> so she's already kind of split herself in that way, and. Um, now that she's talking with Jacoby, she ends up, uh, he, he gives her this hot pink tape recorder. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, she gets to say it into the tapes and then, um, she listens to them back before she gives them to Jacoby. So she says, listening to the tapes makes her feel like the problems spoken on them are not her own. And, um, yeah, so I mean, this is the the cognitive distortions. You know, it's like she's starting to even see that, like, what she's talking about isn't necessarily the like even the most real or the most the you know, like she's not as attached to them once she puts them in a recording, which is interesting. Um, but yeah, at this point, this is when Laura apologizes for not writing more in the diary. And, you know, she promises to do more because that's just her. You know, it's like there's this thing. She says there's this thing that, you know, she promised to do. So she has to do it. I mean, what's happening in practice is she needs the diary less. You know, it's not just that she doesn't have time because, I mean, she's doing meals. on wheels. She's doing, um, you know, the the the. The, the English lessons with Josie. She's doing uh, the Johnny Horn tutoring sessions. You know, she's uh, she's still partying like crazy. Um, 
you know, it's like she can make time if she needs to. Um, but she doesn't need to as much, which is really great that she's got this outlet now. The last time we hear about Jacoby is uh, Jacoby specifically asks her to talk about James and the comment that she said that she went sober because of him. So we get this, um, this small glimpse of James. You know, she's known him a long time. Um, but you know, he's never made the diary, which means he's kind of on that positive frequency that, um, that Laura can't really deal with very often because, you know, um, she doesn't feel that's her authentic self necessarily. Um, you know, it, it doesn't fit in with protector Laura who writes in this diary. Um, is it because she wants to keep James safe? Um, probably, probably that's part of it. Um, but yeah, at the end here, she says that she fell in love with James's purity. And um, a direct quote says, if I was strong enough, I could let James take me out of this darkness. And uh, yeah, I mean, she basically says that he's her last chance for light, which um, I mean, it seems like she's not noticing her light here, but um, but she doesn't take the, t the, the way out anyway, because she basically says she doesn't deserve that. Why is he so good for Laura? I mean, Zan from Ghostwood Podcast uh, basically put it the the clean. I mean, the uh, the um, clearest way. Uh, she says that James would do anything to help Laura, and Bobby would do anything for her. In this same diary entry, um, she basically th this is the second one before the end. So, like, this is her kind of um, framing everybody, like you know, her relationships. Um, right before she died for the whodunit section and i'll talk about that later but um you know it's like what is what does she want um one of the things she wants is that even though james is so good for her she wants this relationship to remain a secret and honestly i think that's probably protecting her from bob kind of situation protecting her from bobby too honestly um but um you know donna's the one who knows the secret besides james and um uh, you know that it it goes right back to that whole thing where you know it's like this is why donna thinks that everything has to be secret you know, about her investigation into uh, Laura, you know, like when she says, you know, it's like, um, hi, Audrey, we're in the bathroom, but um, I need to make sure that you swear to secrecy about this before we start talking about Laura, that kind of thing. She does that a lot in season one. And um, I kind of think it's all cues from Laura at this point that um, Donna got trained that everything has to be secret. Okay, so that was the grand majority of laura's support system but um but you know what what's supposed what happens in this book where laura is supposed to be the support system for others um <clears throat> and that pretty much brings us to troy and jupiter so i'm gonna start with jupiter um Basically, Jupiter fills the same kind of role that Johnny Horn did um, up until Laura was 13. And um, that means that there was about a year, year and a half where, um, where she didn't have anybody to talk to about this kind of stuff, except for like maybe, um, you know, Donna and Bobby. I mean, that's when she kind of starts a relationship with Bobby. But um, she didn't have anybody in her corner at that point who could just, you know, exist with Laura and be completely 100% non-judgmental, which um, Laura specifically points out about Jupiter. Um, you know, when when um, when she says that Jupiter got hit by a car, she's like, you know, I didn't write about him much, but uh, he was a true fan of vanilla ice cream, you know, stuff like that. You know, they they obviously hung out and. Um, Laura, Laura gave him a lot of her, um, information, you know, like just expressing herself that way. Uh, you know, he, he was a good partner and a companion and whatever. And, um, you know, it's like the, the only thing Jupiter ever gave her back was love, which again, you know, he, he's, he's kind of in a similar, um, emotional space as Johnny Horn this way. Um, 
So Laura was 13. It's one of her first entries as a 13 year old. And she talks about how Jupiter was hit, you know, um, uh, Jupiter like chased a mouse out of the house and got hit by a car. Uh, so the mouse, does that connect to the rat dreams? Um, you know, was Jupiter being a protector and like chasing away the things that Laura had to hurt herself to protect herself from, um, you know, before they hurt her? I mean, it, I don't, I don't think this is an explicit thing, but I think there's a certain rhyme to it where we kind of feel the same kind of emotions and like it kind of like, you know, I mean, it's before the rat dream, but it kind of gives the impression of this was the kind of role that Jupiter had in Laura's life. And um, this hit and run driver just took off, never showed. You know, it's like all, all we know is that Jupiter died in the street with Laura. Like he took his final breaths with her when she approached him. Um, and um, like Christian for Manners and Madness, I, I kind of feel like Leland did it. Um, you know, and when when Leland gets home later and starts yelling and screaming about the person who did this and blah blah blah, and you know, it kind of feels like I mean, you know, knowing knowing it's Bob, and you know, it's like Bob might be like, "Oh, she's mine. You can't have her, cat. You have you hold you hold the special place that I'm supposed to, or that no one is supposed to." Um, I I kind of feel like Leland. You know, it's like you know, doth protest too much, you know, or whatever that expression is. Um, you know, at the time, Laura's just barely 13. She could not understand why the car wouldn't stop and own up to what happened. I mean, they're like the world itself has this complete lack of empathy, which just reinforces all her negative perspectives on the world at the time. And then we get another cat related situation where, um, you know, Laura's first entry of being a 15 year old i mean granted it's november um so you know she's been 15 for a few months at this point but um this is the one where she goes into low town with leo and bobby um you know they they barely get out with their lives and some coke and uh bobby kills somebody on the way out or you know the, the guy in the truck bed but yeah so there's all of that and um they come down by taking a lot of coke and then laura decides to go off on her own driving um, to like pick up something in a, you know, a quick stop or whatever you want to call it. I, I think that's what she said. It was like a convenience store she's trying to get to. Um, so, you know, she's, she's high as a kite. Um, she's driving, she sees flesh world for the very first time and reaches down for it. And I mean, you know, eventually we know that this leads to her exploring her sexuality as much as making money. And, uh, you know, the, the, well, I mean, yeah, yeah, there, there are directions with flesh world that are both good and bad. And, um, this is the beginning of that journey, which is really not great because when she looks down to pick up the, the magazine, she ends up hitting a cat and, you know, she's, she's now the, she's now the person who killed a girl's cat. And, um, this girl, Danielle comes out and, um, you know, Laura actually stops, you know, she gives Danielle the respect and acknowledging the severity of what happened. You know, Laura knows because I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a trauma cycle in in a real way for Laura, but, um, you know, Danielle, she, she forgives Laura because Laura understands the severity and the gravity of what has just happened. And, um, you know, she, she tells Laura, I think you're nice. Um, you know, and she does forgive her. Um, and you know, th this could have closed that kind of cycle with Laura. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, she, she did the thing that the person who did it to her could not do for any reason. It would have done that for Laura, except, you know, months earlier at the end of her 14th year, she lets Troy go, you know, she's not feeling together enough. Uh, to take care of anything so she forces troy to leave the stables and go free and of course we know troy's fate will not be good at this point but i'm gonna take a bit of a, a side path for like what 
what horses mean in in Twin Peaks that we know of. And I'm not going to talk about the white horses in um, in part 18 of season three, because that's just a little bit too ambiguous. I mean, it seems more like they're dream guardians for um, the Carrie Page, Laura. And, um, you know, whatever whatever that means, we'll discuss then. But it seems like it's been a little bit. uh, There's an extra level there. Um, but what a white horse means in the show and, you know, the, the white horse appears after the diary. So is it a retconning of what Troy means or is it just coincidence that it's horse is in the first place? It's tough to know what to say about it because I mean, if, if you look at the way that, you know, Laura could be a dreamer, um, she might be projecting horses as a certain kind of a talisman. And um, I know Jasmine over at uh, uh, Damn Fine TV, she just said that about the Part 8 connections with horses, that um, the horses kind of feel like a talisman. And then there's the thing that that, uh, David Lynch said about the jumping man, that the jumping man was a kind of a talisman. So like all of these things in Lodge Space like have these values as visual icons just as much as anything else so um yeah i mean the the horses that appear um they appear to sarah both in fire walk with me and in episode 14 when um you know when there's an unseeable action nearby that is catastrophic you know the death of maddie um the the rape of laura by bob when she finally can see that it's leland um Oh, yeah. And then um, Cooper in part two of season three or, um, you know, the the 2017 Twin Peaks, um, there's a horse in the distance in the red room, you know, the the darkness behind the curtains. When the curtains blow away, there's a white horse back there, too. Um, That kind of feels similar to the way Sarah sees it, though. And um, in the access guide of all places, and I'll go into this during our access guide, uh, episode one day (laughs) but um there's this white moose um that's discussed and i'm pretty confident based on the material here that it's um that it's fulfilling the same role that the white horse does later um i'm gonna read a little bit from my um uh my access guide article i think it's called the uh the only the only access guide resource you'll ever need because I go I go deep into the book there. It, it's like a tour for people who uh, can't find it. But yeah, so the part about the white moose legend, it says, legend has it the moose was the lone survivor of fifty moose that were exterminated by se- by the several dozen trappers that trapped them. Now, drained of his brother's and sister's blood, the white moose appears to those in trouble because it understands the agony of sorrow and despair. There's a lot in the legend of the white moose. As lodge denizens seem to take different shapes depending on who's observing them, I wouldn't be shocked if that meant that the white moose and the white horse weren't one and the same. I love that the melancholy and forgiving white moose appears to those in trouble because it understands the agony of sorrow and despair. Was the horse, at least during the days of Twin Peaks' original production, less a drug metaphor and more a witness to validate and understand someone's pain? I now want to go uh, go through every scene the horse is in and decide whether it could be a presence of compassion much like Carl Rod was for the unnamed mother in season three. So, yeah, I mean, a a symbol of compassion for those who can't really deal with the truth. Um, Honestly, that's a little bit of how Troy is with Laura. So with Troy, he's Laura's best 12th birthday present. Um, You know, Laura names him, and there's that, that line about when a horse is given, they share everything, even a birthday. So they share everything in this book in a lot of ways. You know, both they, they begin, both of them have optimism. Um, both are given to her by someone else through her father, who is the public face. Um, and, you know, in this case, it's Ben Horn, not Bob. Um, ben is a friend of the family. He's always showered attention on her. and. Um, 
I feel like that line about um, Ben Horn being a friend of the family, um, you know, like in the show, it'll say, you know, he, he, Bob is a friend of her father's, like that kind of thing. Like it's, um, it's one of those actual ways to misdirect uh, viewers who might be reading this book before the reveal. Random details. Uh, Troy was initially too young to, to ride and, um, you know, like to, to basically like too young to be a proper horse. Um, and Laura's so young that like, you know, she hasn't even had her period yet. So she's too young to be dealing with things like Bob. Laura goes to the stables for solace. You know, she likes to take care of Troy and it's kind of almost like a meditation area. Um, and um when she's with troy is when she remembers the dream with the log lady so um you know there, there's a safe place with troy um even though as as the days go on troy ends up becoming a cover for when laura wants to be away from the house and she's doing something a little more illicit uh <clears throat> so we see laura caring less and less for troy as she's caring less and less for herself um, and, you know, at the end of Laura's 14-year-old entries, I already mentioned it, but this is about, like, she she and Troy haven't had um, their lives uh, intertwined for even three years at this point. And um, paraphrasing her mentality when she wrote the entry about uh, letting Troy go, um, she's hooked on coke, incapable of choosing right over wrong, depressed, feeling futile. Uh, like everything she makes contact with, will have contact with Bob. With Laura in this state of mind, Troy didn't deserve the life he had and was not free. So, again, she's projecting how she feels about herself onto her horse. And, you know, she thinks her horse needs to be free, too. And, you know, if she can't be, um, at least Troy can be. So she forces Troy out of a stall. And, you know, she even talks, you know, heartbreakingly about how, uh, how Troy even tried to look back, you know, like, what, why, why? Um, so she's traumatizing her horse right here. And, um, you know, this is, this is right before she starts going to low town and, you know, doing drug deals and like just doing all these incredibly scary things like, um, you know, uh, uh, get, getting abducted by a bunch of truckers. I mean, there's all these things that she finds herself in danger of because she's completely unanchored from her own safety net with her parents and everything else, you know. Um, both she both she and Troy are completely running free, and it's not good for either of them. Um, you know, Troy's Troy's support is intentionally removed by Laura, just like her, uh, just like her parents intentionally removed their support of her in a lot of ways. Um, they're both forced to be free. And, um, when Ben Horn calls the, calls Laura to deliver the news, um, he says that, um, Troy was unable to find food and had to be shot twice by border patrol. And you know, border on on the the line between um, between Lodge and uh, the world, you know, between Canada and uh, and and Washington. I mean, there's all these places, and of course, the border patrol is the one who has to shoot Troy. And Laura's reaction to that is, "Everywhere I look, tells me I am such a bad, evil person. If I wasn't so terrible." We could have gone out to the field together. And um, I think, you know, the, the only reason why Laura didn't share the same fate as Troy right around then is because after she had that experience with the truckers, she made it to her support system. She made it to people who actually would take care of her. And, you know, Ronette gave the note that was very specifically caring. And, um, I honestly think they probably saved her life that night. So, I mean, besides the obvious um, heartbreaking nature of Laura's horse having to be shot, um, it's it's got that extra level of bad because it's a step back from where she was when she was talking to Danielle about, about her cat. Um, 
you know, it's like she couldn't tell Ben ever a- anything because she knows that it would be trouble if she owned up to the fact that she's the one who let Troy loose. So, so Laura's cycle with her own animals is basically with Jupiter, she was the known victim. With Danielle's cat, she was the known perpetrator. And with Troy, she was the known victim and the unknown perpetrator. And she became the exact same person who killed Jupiter in that she she drove by without saying anything. You know, it's like no no humans know why the person who let Troy loose did it. And again, like my theory that Leland is the one who hit Troy, I mean, who hit Jupiter, um, it's a family member who did it. And, you know, that's another um, subtle nod to thematic rhyming that it's Leland who's doing everything to Laura. Now, this is definitely a rock bottom moment for Laura. I mean, you know, part of her seems to die with Troy in a lot of ways, but... Honestly, after this is when she starts seeing Johnny for real. Um, You know, it's like there's a certain amount of light that does seem to happen from this moment. Like, you know, it's almost like Laura's turning part of herself around, too. Um, You know, it's like part of her starts to want to restart for the better. And, um, you know, it's like the soberness even begins after this, Um, though it's probably related to other things she isn't writing about. but. at this point, it's almost like she does a little bit of die and fix her heart at the same time. Now, one of the most regularly occurring things in the diary is um, the fact that Laura shares dreams in here. And I mean, sometimes it's coded poetry as well, which um, I may be referencing here and there, but they um, they kind of occupy the same space. And it gives, it gives the internal headspace of Laura to us. Um, you know, at a thematic level, and um, sometimes they um, they cloud over like physical events that are happening. But um, yeah, the 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 thing that I am most focusing on is how Bob started out as a dream to Laura. I mean, I'm not saying it's exactly the same as how Bob started out as a dream for Dale, and then he's eventually taken over by Bob, but. Um, it's it's not entirely dissimilar so uh yeah so let's break it down um bob is named in the first entry and you know she does talk about dreams right there um but um a few a few entries later um even before maddie enters the book um there's this um there's this unknown man like she's never seen this man before apparently um and he has long hair and a beard, and you know he raises his hands and stops the wind. Um, I kind of wonder if this is Bob getting his shape. You know, like his has he always been that shape for Laura, or did it kind of come from that dream, or is it that thing where like she doesn't remember Bob's shape? You know, she knows him by name, but like maybe. Maybe she can't remember him in a physical way until this dream. And then, like, it's not even him, quote unquote. But yeah, I mean, Laura will talk about, I mean, you know, she'll describe things that happen in her dreams. And then um, around the same time, she'll have confusion about having nights in the woods. Um, And eventually she gets to the point where, you know, she's like, I think that this is real. you know, it's like she's she's coming to the conclusion that, you know, maybe it isn't a dream. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's like a masking memory, except that she doesn't see it that way. She sees it as like a real reality. So, like, were the dreams her basically experiencing the after effects of of a reality at at the only level that she could process it? Um, or was it Lodge Space introducing itself to her? the only way it knows how to i mean there's there's a lot of different ways to go through this um you know there's there's all these people that she connects to through dreams too um you know it's like is she manifesting her dreams into sarah's dreams you know like that they have a connection like are, are they connected to lodge space or are they connected to um 
Laura's manifestations as, you know, as if like she were the dreamer and she's making her mom have these dreams and she's making Maddie have these dreams. You know, I mean, she calls it a call for help after her abortion to Maddie. And, um, you know, it's like, oh, she heard my call for help. You know, it's like, is, is Laura a strong sender in like all the important ways where, you know, maybe like in you know, Lynchian descriptor, Laura is the one, you know, that, that kind of angle. It's, it's even here in the diary to be had, if you want to go that way. Um, and you know, her possibly being a dreamer, did she basically manifest, um, her events in fire walk with me to Cooper? And, um, honestly, did she manifest Cooper from the dreams? And like, he's kind of a projection from her. There's, you know, there's, there's no way to verify any of this and you can't really, you can't really go too far when you're, uh, when you're thinking this way, cause there's room for it. Is it mind and body hand in hand, um, with intuition and intention? Like there's all these things that we'll know about Cooper later. And, um, you know, it's like, did he learn it from Laura or is he part of Laura? Um, yeah, and then there's the way that, um, like, like Mark Frost comments about, um, you know, Bob basically being a vampire archetype, where you know it's like he could be, he could be this spirit being trying to get the Garmin Bosia or whatever else that they need, and um, you know he's he's like a parasite from this higher level. I mean, there, it it all flies. And I mean, sure, the dreams can be nightmarish, but there are some positive ones too. Like on um, when Laura's in her sixteenth birthday, like she's describing um, herself, her life um, when she's finally sixteen in the diary, and you know she's talking about she's talking about herself as a twelve-year-old, and she's saying, you know, the the girl who got this diary, you know. Um, before the nightmares um she says and i'm quoting i still had dreams hope that anything was possible i cannot tell you how special and valuable a daydream is i don't i didn't miss it until it was gone without it i became cold paranoid unfriendly and open to all sorts of things and um I mean, like, you, you can't get much more clear than that, that dreams are important in both a negative and a positive direction. And um, I know I mentioned that with uh, characters like Nadine and the season one stuff that I've been talking about and how, like, eventually dreams are there to, you know, hold on to you and heal you. Um, kind of like what Protector Laura is talking about being for, um, for the public Laura that she's trying to keep innocent and safe and, um, you know, protected until she can come out. Um, so yeah, I mean, dreams do that to people too, where they're good things. And, um, uh, like, like one of the daydreams, as I'm going to call it is, um, when, um, when Laura and Donna and the Canadian boys are, um, smoking marijuana and, um, you know, just, just talking and enjoying this weird daydream where they're talking about a giant and all these little universes, uh, stuck on his sweater, like lint. Um, so, you know, like there's like that multiversal cosmic perspective and, um, they were all in a safe place where they were exploring things and, um, you know, probably wishing and hoping all of them. Um, so they, um, they were in a mindset and what do they see? They see a giant. Is it the giant? I don't know, but that character had probably already been filmed. Uh, the, the Carl Stryken character in that season two premiere before Laura, uh, before Jennifer Lynch was done writing this book. So I wouldn't be shocked if that's a nod. But, you know, whether it was a nod or not, it was a uh, positive, I mean, uh, what, what's the word? Exploration for, um, you know, for all these people. And it's based in trust. And, um, yeah, I mean, dreams are good for people sometimes. And, you know, they are calls for help, just like what, you know, Maddie can hear. Um, and and Margaret heard it, too. Um, 
the the scene with the log lady at fourteen hundred River Road, um, Diane podcast basically calls the calls this scene out as one hundred percent supernatural moment, whether um, whether the rest of the book is or not. Um, you know, th- this goes outside of just simple uh, masking memories. Now, this scene is interesting because I mean, Margaret does not physically help Laura out of her house or anything even though uh, Laura does allude to telling her things. Um, You know, per Maya from Manners and Madness, she basically thinks, you know, it it rubs her the wrong way that the log lady knows what's going on yet does nothing um, in in a worldly perspective. Um, And, you know, I do tend to agree with that because it is frightening. You know, it's like, why, why is there this big disconnect between, between Laura essentially asking for help and um and margaret not providing the help um but you know Mar- margaret does end up giving laura a life raft but it's this really small thing um and margaret really does look away when uh when laura tells her that things happen in the woods and um yeah so i mean i feel like margaret's you know in part you know a human can only deal with so much um but in this case, you know, she's following the uh, the message that she got from her own dream about what they're supposed to talk about. Probably, um, you know, she basically cues Laura to be on this path. You know, it's it's up to Laura to choose a path at this point, and you know, it's it's more of a universal outlook. It's about it's about the quality of Laura's soul rather than of her body. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, Margaret does give great advice in the final dossier about, you know, hold on to your light, grow your light. Um, you know, the, the darkness will end, that kind of thing. So, I mean, it, it's kind of the same advice that she's giving to Laura here. Um, honestly, the, the frequency does hold, you know, this, this light that Laura is feeling, this, this positivity, um, it even maintains through Laura writing the diary entry hours later. Yeah, I, I feel like the help that that Margaret gave Laura in this instance was to keep Laura's light lit. You know, it was less about involving law enforcement or taking her out of her home or whatever. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it's it's tough to to put Log Lady's culpability in this. I mean, uh, b- but then you know, there there's this other thing, you know, like where nobody in town understood who Margaret was. I mean, like where, where she lived, I mean, um, you know, it's like the, the Hawk didn't even know, Harry didn't even know, like nobody knew whose cabin it was the, that Margaret was staying in. So like, again, I, I wondered then, and I wonder now is, is Margaret actually connected to reality or is she on a different frequency? That's a little bit higher than the normal stuff. Or the mundane stuff, or the you know the muggle stuff, or whatever word you want to use for it. Um, but there were a lot of wonderful things in there, and there were a lot of warnings about you know these are the things you watch for in the woods. The woods, you can go camping in the woods, but sometimes you learn a little bit too much. And um, um, you know she'll say things like children are sometimes prey, uh, owls are sometimes big, you know things like that. So I mean, I feel like. It was almost like a, a language tutoring session that, that Laura will do for Josie later on. You know, it's like uh, Margaret was giving her the language of the woods so that she can navigate it a little more safely. And from that point forward, she left it up to Laura to shovel her own shit, to, to paraphrase uh, the worldly messenger <laughs> later on of, of Margaret's message. I know there's a lot more to talk about, but I've been talking a while and I feel like the only thing left to talk about is the, um, the whodunit aspects of this book. I mean, cause, cause it really is supposed to, you know, aside from all the spiritual stuff that it was dealing with, I mean, one of its, one of its story point goals for the main series was to, um, make us feel a little more suspicious of people um as far as like maybe they could be the killers or um you know maybe it rules out some people so um yeah i mean what what 
where where do we leave these characters um i mean it kind of it, it softens leo a bit if he did do it it'd probably be more by accident and not you know by not paying attention to laura's state of being um you know though even if he did it he probably wouldn't care much which you know matches leo of season one um the same same qualifiers with Jacques. um <clears throat> You know, Josie, like maybe, you know, she could have killed Laura out of, um, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing why, um, Eckert would want Harry dead, um, sexual jealousy. Um, then, you know, Harold could, could have done it because he was assaulted by Laura. And, um, you know, I mean, he's messed up from it, obviously. Uh, even, even in this diary, we, we know that he's kind of like, unhinged so like maybe he could have done it uh when when laura was dropping off the diary i mean there's <laughs> there's all sorts of ways to go with that um and you know ben horn obviously is the most one um the most suspicious one you know i uh, someday i'm gonna tell the world about ben horn um you know he he went from a secret horse supplier to a sexual partner uh before the end of this and um yeah and uh you know, friend of the family, friend of your father's, uh, that that kind of thing. Um, anyone at One Eye Jacks could have had the vendetta. Um, you know, Jacoby, he knows so much about her, and um, you know, did he finally get pushed too far uh, from jealousy or anything, or um, did he let his attraction take on too much? Uh, he could have done it. Um, and then, you know, of course, uh, I well. Uh, Audrey, you know, maybe she's jealous of how um, she keeps getting closer and closer to her father. As I said in um, the the season one finale episode, I mean, you know, she um, she wanted the attention that Laura got from her father, except she didn't know what kind of attention it fully went into. Um, so yeah, maybe maybe Audrey's that much of a psychopath. Yeah, <laughs> there's uh, there's all sorts of ways, and then of course Sarah and Leland could both be. Um, because of their absence, you know, there, that, that could be the tip off that it could be them or one of them. Um, I feel like the book essentially rules out Bobby. Um, but you know, I mean, per, uh, what, what was it? The, the first episode or the pilot, um, you know, he types in that little, um, that word, that word typing thing uh, and shows it to Harry. Uh, he didn't do it. So, you know, Cooper already ruled him out anyway. Um, and, you know, same thing for Donna and James, but, you know, yeah, I mean, the show basically says that they didn't do it. And, um, this book just reinforces that. Now you'll probably notice that I haven't been talking too much about multiple timelines or anything like that this episode, even though that's kind of my pet thing. Um, with like multiple frequencies. Um, I think, um, you know, whether, whether you believe in multiple timelines, whether you believe in the multiple frequencies, um, if Cooper goes back in time, absolutely nothing changes in this book. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish up with, um, with something on this subject from my, um, from my article on the audiobook, uh, it, oh yeah, <laughs> it's titled Cheryl Lee voices trauma in the secret diary of Laura Palmer audiobook. And it gets in your head, no matter how you look away. I love twin peaks with all my heart. It was foundational and hit me at the right time to embed itself in the language of existential questions. A preteen begins instinctively exploring twin peaks and growing up will always be tied together for me. But I swear to God, I will always get uncomfortable on Twin Peaks Day because I will never forget that a girl was gaslighted and abused and forced to make a choice to die. I will never forget that the trauma-laced life and death of Laura Palmer is the major foundation of Twin Peaks, even more so than the character of Dale Cooper. Most people look away from this fact, show the white of their eyes, and drink full, but I can't. Trauma isn't removable. There is only navigating through it one second at a time. It's not easy. It takes longer than is comfortable, but it will end. Timelines can't forget trauma, and this book and audiobook will never let you forget either. 
Fire Walk With Me is an incredibly rough movie that puts Cheryl Lee's skill to the test as we watch her go through hell as Laura. And even if you think there's divergent timelines, all but the last major scenes after she got off James's bike still happen to Laura Palmer. By that logic, absolutely every page of The Secret Diary happened, whether or not Dale Cooper changed the true past. Bob was progressively more and more present in Laura's life. Her struggles to do good versus being bad, and the heartbreaking effects of her abuse by either Bob or Leland is unchanged. Laura suffered badly through no fault of her own, whether Dale Cooper went back to the past or not. In canon, if you're one of those people, this book is completely unchanged by anything that happened in the modern incarnation of Twin Peaks. And this book is the most difficult goddamn thing of all of them. This puts you in the head of a girl who cannot forget her abuse no matter how much pie and coffee you put in front of her. And if that doesn't sum up in a nutshell kind of how I how I feel about approaching this book, I don't know what will. Um, it's it's a tough one. I mean, I I can't um I can't imagine actually going through something like this. Um with or without supernatural, you know, it's it's just uh but we made it through it. We made it all the way through this book finally. Um yeah, next week we're well next time anyway i know this one had a little bit more delays than i was expecting for various reasons so um next time we're gonna finally go back into season two and uh, get this thing rolling again at this point all that's left to say is the sign off so you have been listening to the Blue Rose Task Force podcast a production of ruminations radio network and tv obsessive radio If you resonate with what you're hearing, please subscribe, rate, and review our show, and we would love to connect with you on Twitter at Blue Rose TF Pod and at Instagram and Facebook at Blue Rose Task Force. You can find me at JPB underscore Little Green on Twitter and John underscore The underscore Peaky on Instagram. Visit Ruminations Radio Network for additional great shows such as Cinephile Hissy Fit and Retro Futurist Culture. Find any number of Classic 25 YL articles and content on many other TV shows at tvobsessiveradio.com. And if you want to be part of our monthly mailbag episodes, send your comments, questions, and feedback to Blue Rose Task Force Podcast at gmail.com. We'll see you next time as we cover episode 8, the ninth overall episode of Twin Peaks, and the first episode of Twin Peaks Season 2. Until then, listeners, I'll see you in my dreams. I wish you the best of luck. To kind of deepen and expand the universe that the show takes places. The show takes places. The show takes places. They'll really dig it. This is a, a gift to all the fans.